The views, comments, stories, and opinions shared within this podcast are our own or those of our guests and in no way represent the views of the companies, associations, or organizations that any of us may work for or represent. All stories, events, and tales shared within this episode may or may not have happened in the manner in which they were told. They may or may not have even happened at all. The details have been changed to protect the innocent and the guilty alike. This is Squawk Ident. You're listening to Squawk Ident, an aviation podcast that explores the many pathways to an aviation profession, the challenges that a professional aviator can expect in today's marketplace, and we share many stories along the way. I'm your host, Aviator Tony, a professional airline pilot currently flying for a U.S. legacy airline with close to 20 years on the flight line. Welcome aboard Flight 83 of the Squawk Ident podcast, recorded on the 13th of July, 2021. From the Aviator Sound Studios from somewhere in Southern California. On today's flight, we are proud to be joined by some fantastic Squawk Ident crew members. Rob D is here, and he will fill us in on how his A321 initial flight training has been progressing. We're also very excited to welcome back Kyle J to the show. Kyle has had his hands full, juggling a full flight schedule, managing his Facebook page, the Aviation Business Information Board, or ABIB as we call it, their newborn baby, and now a new home that he and his family are getting ready to move into. He's a brave man. Today, we will also explore the recent controversy with a new FAA policy that went into effect just yesterday on July 12th that limits the flight training for compensation in aircraft that hold special airworthiness certificates, including limited, experimental, and primary category aircraft. We discuss how an FAA advisory committee has recommended that airlines get woke and replace sexist terms with more general or gender neutral ones. Are masks going away? The federal mask mandate is set to expire in September. How will that affect our operations here in the U.S.? We also look at the mystery of why a 46-year-old Rodez Express Boeing 737-200 cargo aircraft operating as Transair Flight 810 ditched off the coast of Honolulu on July 2nd. All this and more on this Flight 83 of the Squawk Ident Podcast. Now that our pre-flight is complete, let's get ready to push off the gate and start those virtual podcast engines. Flight 83 of the Squawk Ident Podcast is officially underway. To help me kick off today's show is a superb aviator and Squawk Ident co-host. He is a former international professional racquetball champion, a member of the 9G Club, an AMP and avionics tech, an RC, RC aircraft commander, a boat skipper, a commercial drone operator, and currently an Airbus pilot for Legacy Airlines. The name we use here on the show is an alias to our employer, a U.S. mainline carrier. He joins us today while he is recovering from his third week on the Planet Killer Base, where he is re- receiving Airbus training. From his man cave, from somewhere in Flower Mound, Texas, help us in welcoming back our very own Rob D. Rob, how the heck are you? I'm doing great, Aviator Tony. How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great, man. So you've been busy. I have. Very busy. Uh, just uh, trying to forget how, how to fly a 737 and uh, learn how to fly an Airbus, which is completely a different way of flying for uh <laughs> yeah yeah the definitely the boeing guys are going what <laughs> if it ain't boeing it ain't going well i gotta tell you man it's a nice airplane the airbus is definitely a uh a pilot's airplane uh it's er- you know as you will you know ergonomics of the airplane is are fantastic and the automation is just you know it's, it's perfect for the c- type of flying that we do yeah. You know, the long hauls and, you know, the long days. So um, I'm learning to embrace it, and I really like uh, <laughs> the new setup. So it's going well. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're having a good time. Um, you know, the, I was very fortunate uh, to be able to be selected to be on that aircraft right from the beginning uh, when I yeah. got hired on. And uh, I got to tell you, I came in with a little bit of a, uh, an unfair advantage, I'd have to say, after over a decade of commuting back and forth to Chicago yeah. from either LA or from Seattle or from wherever I was living at the time, I had experienced many, many jump seat rides on all kinds of aircraft, 7.5s, yeah. 7.8s, uh, the, the MD-80. 
and the yeah. 7 3 and the A321 were the two primary types of aircraft that I was using um, mm-hmm. to commute back and forth to work every week. And yep. what a difference that jump seat is between a 737 and an yeah. Airbus. I mean, yeah. I used to have rivet marks on the side of my head where I'd fall asleep <laughs> against that panel and the rivet marks from the metal. And it's just so uncomfortable. Yeah. And you're, oh, and, you yeah. know, you couldn't, you couldn't even really have a bottle of water up there because where are you going to put it? You know, a little coffee cup holder and you, yeah. <laughs> and so there, then I was on the Airbus and it's like mid flight. I'm like, I'm just going to stand up and stretch my legs right here, you know, and yeah. lay spread out, you know, and uh-huh. stow the, stow the seat and just lay out flat yeah. on the floor if I had to <laughs> and catch yeah. a nap. <laughs> <laughs> the way, the way I've been explaining it to my family and friends, it's like taking an old, I don't know, 57 Chevy pickup truck, which was great back in its day, right? 737 was built in the 60s. It's a great airplane. Yeah, it's a workhorse. It still is. Yeah. Right? But it's the difference from going from a 57 Chevy to a brand new Tesla. I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's a it's a night and day difference, totally different, you know, in, in flying or driving philosophy. And um, I, I'm really liking it. You know, it's really cool. I, I can't wait to uh, actually fly the real one yeah. and, uh, you know, get my feet wet that way. But yeah. Uh, I, I'm just fired up for it, so it's, yep. it, it's it's exciting to me. Let me know when you got your IOE, your first <laughs> landing, and I'm gonna fly out there and get some video for you. <laughs> yeah, it'd be good. Yeah, I do. I already have some um, some simulator video that uh, my training partner took while we were doing a V1 cut. Um, so I, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll share that with you. And nice. uh, it, it, it's pretty fun to watch. It's it, it's a non-event. It's crazy yeah. how it is. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Trim it out and guy, let's get that autopilot on. It'll take That's care of it. itself. It flies better than me yeah. anyway. <laughs> it did. <laughs> well, also joining us today is another fantastic crew member that has a new position here at Squawk Ident. We first introduced him on Flight 46, all in the flying family. And then again in Flight 66, Rona, the six minute flights, and the cadet program. He joins us as a Squawk Ident crew member and co host. He is an OSU Pistol Pete loving grad, an ASL linguist, a creator and director of the Aviation Business Information Board on Facebook. That's where we get most of our stories from, by the way. Uh, he's a philanthropist, a pilot, a cadet mentor, a new dad, and a DFW Airbus pilot at Legacy Airlines. Taking a break from packing up all his stuff where, <laughs> from somewhere in Keller, Texas, please help us in welcoming to the show, Mr. Kyle Jensen. Kyle, how the heck are you? I'm doing great, Tony. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, and thanks so much for joining us. Glad to be here. I'm excited to be back. So, what's been going on with you? I mean, we've got, we've got the baby. We knew about this. You've got, you know, all these other programs that you're into. The, the <laughs> Aviation Business Information Board every day puts up at least six to ten to, to a dozen stories about what's going on in our industry. On top of that, you just bought a house and you're moving. What the? I mean, do you ever sleep? No, no. Uh, you know, you got to drink coffee or iced tea that keeps you going up 20 hours a day and uh, just uh, uh, just keep on trucking. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the uh, the house thing was out of the blue. Uh, wife and I found a uh, beautiful new home around the corner from our current house. Um, we're outgrowing our house uh, right now with the baby. And yeah, um, she's going to start crawling here next couple months and uh, wanted a little bit more room to grow. Found this beautiful house. And uh, be honest with you, we didn't think we were going to get it, you know, with the, how the market is right now. So put an offer in, wrote a, a little backstory on our family and uh, uh, they liked it and really enjoyed the story about uh, my, my little girl, Olivia. And uh, uh, we're they chose us over the uh, the other offers. So, so you submitted um, an offer through your realtor, and you included a letter about yes who your family is, and yes, and that's you think the deciding factor. Yes, I, I think it was. Wow. Um, we we've looked around in the area. We like the area we're in. Uh, currently in Keller, and uh, this new house is in uh, uh, pretty much downtown Roanoke, just west of downtown Roanoke, about five ten minute drive, depending on how many lights you hit. But uh, um, we're, we're, we're looking around at Keller and everybody was bidding over asking quite a bit. And uh, I, I think this house that we found, they uh, had a deal fell through and uh, we just kind of came across over it on Father's Day. And 
went and looked at it and uh really liked the house and pulled comps and gave them what it was worth so we we weren't even uh fighting with anybody and uh offered everything to them and really nice offer gave him a lease back and uh here we are <laughs> so, <laughs> that's amazing so, so I am looking. I am looking for some help uh, moving uh, at the end of August. <laughs> if uh, anybody's listening to this, you know, uh, maybe throwing a six pack. We'll see. Yeah, there you go. Reach <laughs> out to uh, aviatortoni at gmail. You got my number, we'll... man. <laughs> Just give me a call, man. I'm not I'm right, not too far from you. So, well, there you go. So, yep. So, yep. So uh, new Remember house. Taking care of each other. Yes. Uh, new house. Uh, flying a lot uh, here in DFW and. Uh, uh, keeping everybody up to date on the uh, the business page and mm -hmm. uh, lot, lots of still a lot of new infos uh, going on. And uh, uh, the, the great news that I want to share with everybody is to uh, everybody starting to hire again. So um, get those suits out, get them dry clean, start wor uh, working on your uh, your questions and your answers for the interview process and uh, keep those apps up to date. Yeah. Um, update them weekly, weekly. And uh, even even if you want to just after every flight um, update it because um, now's the time to update, get in. You don't want to be behind the ball uh, when you get that phone call, yeah. that interview. You want to you want to have your stuff ready to go and ready to roll because it's uh, things are about to start moving again, and uh, they're gonna think uh, it's gonna be here before you know it. So yeah. keep applying, keep uh, studying, and. Uh, keep up to date with that. Yeah, how exciting. I mean, yeah. we've seen these cyclical events in our industry now. You know, we've been, you know, I know Rob and I have been in this industry since, you know, early 2000s. So we're, you know, we've seen a thing or two. Um, and we fly with people that have been in this industry since the, the late 80s. <laughs> and, uh, and they know a thing or two. Um, but I got to say that, you know, we were talking about this years ago here on this podcast about how this rubber band effect that the, this, uh, extreme economic downturn that this, you know, pandemic has created around the world. And, you know, we have friends all over the world in Italy and Iceland, especially, and, you know, I've speaking with some of my friends over in Iceland, they're still not flying and there's no flying to be had anywhere. And they're luckily their governments take care of them and they do other things. And, you know, <laughs> all, all my Icelandic uh, Viking friends have beards like they're freaking <laughs> ready to get on a boat and paddle. Uh, <laughs> and they're sitting there eating their slotar. <laughs> and but uh but, you know, for them, it's, it's, I think, a lot tougher. But here in the U.S., we are so fortunate that we are seeing this rubber band effect. We are coming back stronger than ever. I just got done flying yesterday at noon. I had a, a, an amazing trip. The, the flights were full. I mean, we're going to talk a little bit about that a little later in the show. But, I mean, the airports are full. I see my friends posting things on social that you know, airports, I haven't seen this airport this busy, there are lines everywhere. And, you know, a lot of the eating establishments are slowly starting to, to go to full capacity now. So the lines aren't that bad. I mean, things are really looking up. So yeah, if, if you're in a position where you're looking for work at a 121 operator, oh my God, it's going to be like shooting fish in a barrel here before you know it. Yeah. Yes, definitely. You get to pick which one you want to go to, and it uh, you'll be able to negotiate, uh, see which one offers the uh, the best, uh, and uh, roll with it. Yep, yep. And we're gonna have contracts. Uh, I know Legacy is in alleged negotiations for a new contract, a, an updated contract. Um, I know that all the other big uh, airlines out there all have their contracts coming up. We have Delta, American, United. Uh, they're all getting ready to to sign something in and the longer it takes for that to happen the better off i think the pilot group will be because as flying demand increases and as pilot demand increases that just means compensation's going to have to be on par so yeah things are looking good this is a i've always said this is a decent profession as long as you have the wherewithal to 
not overspend, you know, not get a job in day one and then buy a house and a new car and everything else. And then, you know, what do I mean? I got furloughed six months in. <laughs> so yeah, as long as you play your cards right and, and make smart decisions, and this is a great, great field to be in. Definitely. Yes. So let's, you know, a little bit about what I've been going through this week. Um, it's been a couple of weeks since the last podcast and, and, you know, it's kind of a broken record lately, but we all have been very busy, you know, a lot like what we we're talking about. Um, and I had on the last show, I was pulled off of work because of a, a potential COVID scare because I came down with a head cold and something I picked up either on the trip before or somehow somewhere. I don't have no idea. There's no way of knowing. And so I had to stay home and quarantine until I got my results back. And sure enough, it was a negative COVID result, uh, which I anticipated as, um, I, did the vaccination thing. We've talked about that on the show. So I wasn't in anticipating that, but I got a head cold and it was pretty bad. Um, a lot of coughing. I got, uh, some prescriptions to take care of that. And within about four days, it cleared up pretty well. And to the point where my family and I were looking at each other going, well, um, what, what we have like five, six days off, let's go and spend the fourth with my family up in Northern California. So that's what we did. We packed the car and we jumped in the car and we all took a little road trip up there. And on the first two days, we helped my mother out with, you know, some uh, moving furniture around and whatnot. She had just moved into one of her units in the duplex. And so we were helping her with that. And I even did some tiling work in her bathroom. And so we were a little just family together, home cooked meals, not really going out and partying and and just had a very nice time. And uh, then my wife started coming down with a cough. And then that developed into a pretty bad cough. And then that got to the point where it's like, okay, we need to <laughs> cut this vacation short and go home. And that's exactly what we did. Um, and unfortunately, she came down with the same respiratory thing and went through the same hoops and the same visit with the doctor and the doctor did the same thing and you're gonna have to take a COVID test even though you're vaccinated and so her test came back again negative uh so we were all clear it was just another head cold and it's pretty bad um uh, different opinions from the doctors about uh, you know since we've all been isolated for over a year we haven't been exposed to much so our immune system is a little lower all this hand sanitizer and hand washing is great, but it also means you're not introducing your body to viruses and whatnot. So that could be potentially it. Uh, another doctor said, yeah, no, that's not it. Uh, the truth is this virus that's going around is a, it's a, we've seen a lot of people with it and it's, it's pretty bad. It's like a five day virus and no flu or anything. It's just really bad, really nasty. And so that's what we've been contending with. Well, um, since we got all the all clear, I went ahead and went back to work this week and I did a three day trip. And on the last episode, we talked about the new passenger weights, how they're higher now at legacy airlines because of the mandatory uh, periodic evaluation that the FAA has the airlines do. We discovered that the Airbus has a limitation that could be exceeded with the new passenger weights, and it must be coordinated with the below wing services or the ground personnel. So we loaded up in Tucson the other morning, actually yesterday morning, and as our normal procedures dictate, when it was time to go, we shut the door, ran our checklist, we pushed off the gate. Usually on the taxi out, somewhere between the gate and the runway, the airplane will receive a printed out electronic weight and balance. And once that happens, the first officer's job is to verify winds, weights, and temperatures, make sure that the aircraft has the performance to, to take off in the current configuration that was planned or anticipated, and verify, put all the numbers in the flight management system, verify that with the captain, and take off. Well, we pushed off the gate, and as a habit, I usually have operations to whatever station we're in on comm number two. If I'm not listening to a ramp control somehow, I'm listening to operations until we're number one for departure. So that's what I did. Uh, there was no ramp control in Tucson, so I had ground frequency in the first radio, and I had our legacy airlines operations frequency in the second radio. 
as we pushed off the gate, we started both engines. We were running a checklist. We were in the middle of doing a flight control check. And I heard operations call our flight number and say, we need you to come back to the gate. And I'm like, okay, what's why? why? Uh, well, uh, we have a aft CG limit. We need to remove four bags from the aft cargo compartment and put them in the forward cargo compartment. And I was like, oh. and I knew exactly. <laughs> we were just talking about this on the podcast. I knew exactly what this was. Captain's like, what? Why? I don't know what. I'm like, yeah, they just need to move it. So we start, you know, okay, now we got to coordinate with ground control, let them know that this is what we're going to do. And, you know, and we had a wheels up time going to Dallas. So that was going to get canceled. And so, yeah, it, it was kind of a big deal. Um, it, it only delayed us about 15 minutes, but there you go. We were just talking about this on the last podcast. Weight and balances go up. Something else is going to be limiting. And that's exactly what happened. Damn. Damn, I think that happened in quite a few places. My, uh, I have a good friend of mine that that works uh, in corporate headquarters, and, and this is part of his program, uh, being the uh, ramp and tower policy guy. Mm. And uh, the next day, I called him up, and I was like, hey, man, how's it going? You know, just checking in on him. And he was like, oh, man, you wouldn't believe, you know, all these delays we had yesterday because of, you know, because of the changes in weights and everything. And and, and it's just, uh, it's, I'm sure all airlines across the board had a little bit of a, uh, <laughs> so, you know, recovery from the change. So yeah, well, we're not the only ones, but man, yeah, it's a good change though, right? I mean, I yeah. saw some of the weights in there and, you know, you look at the uh, pilot plus bag, it says uh, 255 pounds. I'm not sure if this is all accurate, but uh, I've got this from somewhere. But, um, you know, that's 15 pounds more than what it used to be. So that's about right for me. <laughs> but, you know, the, with the pilots, uh, I've noticed this since the, the beginning of my career to now. It seems like the captains are getting smaller. Those big guys younger. With the, and they're getting younger. Yeah, those big yeah. guys with the, hold on, I got to move my seat back before you do a yeah. flight control check because you're going to hit me in my gut. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> those guys are like few and far between well, now. <laughs> they're they're, they're on the wide body Airbus, time. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, on uh, the 7.3, you'd see guys actually slide their seats back before you do the flight control check because uh, you're going to just, you know, you're just going to bounce off their bellies uh, with, <laughs> with the yoke. But... <laughs> And that's when you, you stare at them I while you're doing them, it. You're like, oh, I do. I'm like, well, you're going to have to move back because, you know, we may need the full, you know, the full mo full throw of this flight control. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's, that's what I've been contending with. Um, but yeah, it was a great, great flying opportunity. I did a, a four mile run in Tucson. Uh, we got Damn. in like at 10 o'clock in the morning and it was still uh, under triple digits. So I'm like, Hey, when we get to the hotel, I'm going to go for a run. If you want to meet up later, we can like go to this place and go get fish tacos or something. He's like, yeah, sure. So I got there and right away. I had down like half a Gatorade and I went for a run. <laughs> and, uh, mm -hmm. in, in Tucson, the blocks are very much like square blocks and it's one mile per corner per main corner, you know, street light. So I just said, ah, oh, you know, I'll go around one block. It's four miles. That's, it's easy. Right. Yeah, I was looking for snakes and and but I thought <laughs> they're not going to come out cuz they'll get cooked on the sidewalk. <laughs> it was so hot. so hot. It was 100 yeah. degrees by the time I got back and I think I lost some some weight and sweat. <laughs> That's for weight. sure. Um yeah. but yeah, and then I got back to the room and guess what? I watched the the Italy England game. Did you guys get a Oh, you watched it? Oh, yeah. I didn't watch it. Oh, yeah, my god, yeah. Either. Yeah, my Too family busy. were all like <laughs> texting each other and and I, we were I so heard happy. there were some Heard there were some elbows thrown and wasn't a fair. Eh, you uh, know, game. come on. If you watch, there, you know, if you watch uh, European football at any at any length, you'll see that 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 was actually a pretty civilized game. <laughs> 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 so yeah. that's it, you know. And and what about uh, Kyle? What about you? Did you fly recently with uh, yeah. these heavier weights? Uh, no, just before the weights and uh, quite a few captains that I've flown with, uh, we've been talking about the new weights and especially the new XLRs that our legacy carriers getting to mm -hmm. do Europe. 
So we everybody's been discussing how is this going to affect um, the European flying because we're having issues with it just on these transcons yeah. with the new weights. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see uh, how that will be handled. I'm, I'm glad yeah. that uh, we're testing out now and seeing what needs to uh, change or be upgraded and uh, see where they can fix some issues Yeah, uh, before we start uh, doing Europe. Yeah, and it's good to hear that the Neo is not affected by this. I guess they kind of anticipated uh, this, and you know, in the design of the aircraft, I would assume that the XLRs, since they're a newer version, the same. would mm -hmm. have the same yeah. uh, where they've accounted for these kind of things. So, and Rob, when was your last flight? It was a uh, the seven three seven flight from uh, Colorado Springs back to Dallas a couple of weeks ago. I think we talked on talked about it on episode 82 yeah. But yeah that was my actual flight um so it was all pre weight change mm -hmm. um so yeah it's been a couple of weeks yeah it's been about oh about three weeks and you're and yeah. you're you know knee deep in the simulator world which yeah one week away from the last sim i hope <laughs> yeah well you know uh we are all pulling for you i know you're gonna do great because <laughs> i am, expect nothing less from you <laughs> I appreciate it. I got a 97 on my systems test and I, I only missed I missed one because I I knew the answer, but you know, it's one of those where you kind of click to too miss fast. One. Yeah, you, you just you miss one on like one. that. Yeah, not miss one. And then there was two that I just flat out I was like, ah, whatever, I don't care. I don't even know these. <laughs> yeah. So it's a computer based so. test, if I remember correctly. Yep. You sit there, it's a hundred questions. Hundred questions, 100 two questions. hours to take it. Yep. And, and what's the minimum you need to pass? Uh, I think it was an eighty-five. So, so you can only you, miss fifteen. Just take, just you know, answer eighty-five questions and then just click submit, and you're good. You walk out the door. You're yeah, good. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's what my that's what actually my sim partner did. <laughs> what he knew? Yeah, no, he did. He he got he got five wrong. So he said, "Well, I have to get to 90. <laughs> so he did like 91 or 92 just to make sure he got you know above the 85 percent and he's like all right i'm done he's like how many did you get wrong he's like, oh, it doesn't matter i got an 87 <laughs> i had to get to my commute flight <laughs> yeah i was like what uh, yeah like, we got eight we got like six more seven more to do just knock them there out and go through all of them and then double check and triple check yep. and yeah, yeah I, it was like the last uh, 10 were like so easy just like click 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 you know, it was just that fast, yeah. but anyway. That's when uh, short-term memory is very useful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's you an know, open book test, too, so it's like, you, you, you uh, could look it up if you had to, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Whatever. I, know. I love it. Who wants to do that, Rob? I mean, I know, that, you know we're, all, too we're all much pilots brain work, here. That's too much right? work to open do. Book. I know. If you don't you know it, just, just go pa do something else, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, recently... Uh, we were kind of going back and forth with some of these uh, recent articles that have been surfacing here um, and uh, found one on the Aviation Business Information Board that indicated that the FAA has recently issued a policy. It's a docket number FAA 2021-0592. And it went into effect yesterday, July 12th that limits flight training for compensation in aircraft that hold special airworthiness certificates, including limited or, experiment, or experimental and primary category aircraft. And this uh, information is what I found from the National Aviation Association article that was posted on the 9th. And this new FAA par policy on certain flight training raises the NBAA concerns. Um, and I'll have a link in the show notes to the article, but let's see here. Yeah, I haven't read this. What's the NBAA? National Business Aviation Association. Okay. Yes. So this, this was introduced because there was a lot of, there's been a lot of activity of mom and pop places or even uh let's get the examples up in the, the northeast i think this is what kind of tipped it with the uh b20 uh b25 that crashed yeah uh they were giving rides and you know you got an old old airplane old radials there's very limited amount of people that know how to work on those airplanes and lost an engine it uh, crashed up the northeast and it killed 
bunch of people. They were given rides that were paying for rides. Um, you go to these mom and pop places around the country that have steermans that have, you know, all these cool old World War II, even some World War I airplanes that you pay. Um, you can go get a ride in it um, that have had some issues. And I've, I've, I've heard some horror stories about, you know, the 85 year old still wanting to fly and want, still wanted to give rides in his steerman, but you know, the FAA wouldn't get in the airplane with them, uh, for his check and, uh, giving rides. And eventually they ended up, end up killing themselves for doing something stupid. Mm. Um, so that, that, that's kind of where they were going with that. Um, uh, with, with the older airplanes and being 91, you obviously don't have the, uh, uh, required training that, uh, everybody has, else has to do in the 121, 135, and even the, uh, corporate, uh, flying world. So, um, the, that's kind of the backstory on that. Yeah. And the NBAA.org uh, posted this article back on July 9th and, you know, it, like what Kyle is saying, it, it stemmed from but, B25, uh, B17. Yep. One of the, one of the bombers. <laughs> the old tail dragger. Yep. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of what with the, this article with the FAA, they're putting it all together as uh, what is, uh, what was the article was going into. Yeah. Um, so this is, this is from the 2019 crash, actually, the, yes. the Boeing 17 or B1, yes. B17 flying fortress that crashed. They were given rides out of the Bradley International Airport, Windsor Locks, Connecticut. Um, and seven of the 13 people on board were killed. Another six, um, as well as the person on the ground were injured and the aircraft was destroyed by fire with only the tail and a portion of one wing remaining. So the FAA said, yeah, yeah, this, we can't allow this to happen. This has to, this has to stop because we can't have people giving rides in airplanes and they're not regulated. Yes. As it sounds like lack of oversight for sure. Yes. And in in that area. So, and I, I guess it's good as well. They, they put a stamp on all of it, just like Tony was talking about, uh, the RVs, these Lancers, um, all these experimental airplanes that you can get for a third of the price of, you know, a Cessna or, uh, you know, Piper, uh, one of the, uh, uh, Textron, one of the aircraft builders already out there. Um, but the problem you get into is it's experimental. Um, you're not doing the proper flight testing. Um, yeah. Even uh, certification and testing, certification yeah. testing, and I, I know the uh, the Piper Malibu Malibu Meridian that family, um, uh, when it was coming out, you had a lot of these non pilots, uh, so people with you know compensation uh, buying these airplanes, and they'd take them up to altitude, and they're not used to thinner air up at out you know in the twenties. And what they were doing, they were stalling the airplane, and uh, there were a few crashes with that. So uh, these experimentals, as we're finding out, especially Lance Air, they're creating a uh, pressurized um, uh, recip and a turboprop airplane now that are both pressurized that can get into the uh, mid twenties, even the low thirties. So uh, your everyday pilot's going to know, hey, you know. Uh, AOA is, is the key. Don't want to get up here, get slow, install the airplane and uh, spin it into the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, you, you need to get proper training from uh, these companies or uh, somebody that has had proper training uh, that can conduct that. And do you remember yeah. there was a high altitude endorsement? Yes. I remember reading. And what's, do you remember that? Uh, I know you have to get it. Um, usually when you get a, a type rating or, uh, a, I got it when I got, uh, trained in the, uh, 400 series, uh, I think it was like, uh, uh Presto Sim or Simcom or you know, one of those that, uh, they'll sign you off. And what it is, is that you just talk about the, uh, uh, flight characteristics at high altitude, um, uh, you know, uh, the air density is less. So you, you, you gotta be careful. You gotta, you gotta watch what the airplane's doing. You can't just, yeah. you know, let it do its thing. So and I think human um, factors and physiology yeah. too, is part of all yeah. that too. Uh, that's where so, you learn about the hypoxia and histotoxic yes. yeah. hypoxic yep. and all that good stuff. Yep. And I, and I yep. recommend the FAA 
does uh, in Oklahoma City. They have a, a high altitude ch- uh, chamber that you can go mm-hmm. into, and they have a, a survival course that I highly recommend for everybody. Oh. And last time I went, it was free. Um, so you could go do the high altitude chamber, see everybody's body reacts different to yeah. if you have hypoxia. Sounds uh, like you've done it. Like that. Kyle? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, I've done, uh, I did one in the Altus Air Force Base. Yep. It's, it's awesome. Yep. It really is a, an eye opening experience and a great learning, uh, you know, a great learning event. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Cause you realize that, uh, it's, it's no joke and, you don't realize you, you realize that you don't know that you're getting hypoxic exactly. until it's too late. Exactly. It's, it's really interesting. It's really amazing. Yeah. So Oklahoma city, uh, the FA has that, you uh, you can go in and, uh, last time I did it, it was free and I uh, highly recommend the, the course to uh, any of the young aviators out there that, uh, definitely are uh, doing some research on it. Yep. And just as you're talking there, I went on AOPA.org, great resource for this kind of information, especially if you're a student pilot or a pilot working on your ratings. And in there, they indicate that high altitude endorsement is often misunderstood. According to Title 14 CFR 61.31G, or GULF, the endorsement is not required to operate as pilot in command of every pressurized aircraft. However, pressurized aircraft, according to Part 61, is defined as a pressurized aircraft that has a service ceiling or maximum operating altitude, whichever is lower, above flight level 250 or 25,000 feet MSL. Prior to receiving your high altitude endorsement, you will need to receive and log ground and flight training from an authorized instructor. The ground training must include at least the following subjects, as we talked about, high altitude aerodynamics and meteorology, respiration, effects, symptoms, and causes of hypoxia, and any other high altitude sickness, the duration of consciousness consciousness without supplemental oxygen, the effects of prolonged usage of supplemental oxygen, causes and effect of gas expansion and gas bubble formation, preventative measures for eliminating gas expansion, gas bubble formation, and high altitude sickness, physical phenomena and incidence of decompression, and any other physiological aspects of high-altitude flight. After meeting the ground training requirements, the instructor who provided the ground training will make an endorsement in your logbook or training record to certify that you've satisfactorily accomplished the ground training. And then you'll have to do the flight training. You'll receive logbook Endorsement, once you've completed a normal cruise flight operations while operating above 25,000 feet MSL, proper emergency procedures for simulated rapid depressurization or decompression without actually depressurizing the aircraft, that's key, and an emergency descent procedure. Once that flight training is completed, your instructor will fill out an endorsement in your logbook. So 25,000 feet, that's the key. If that's you, the key. If you're... In an airplane that can go above 25,000 feet, or you are going to fly, what was it, above, even if you're lower than that? 12, uh, above 12.5, you have to have some sort of oxygen system. Yeah, but you don't so need the endorsement. You don't need the endorsement. However, I would highly recommend it. Yeah. Because about... Uh, about every pressurized airplane, you're going to get into the 20s. Maybe not up to 25,000 feet, but you're going to be, you know, at least high teens, low 20s, yeah. and uh, 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 you know, every altitude. The higher you go, the 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 worse it gets. But uh, it, it's still something uh, good to have and uh, good to know how your body reacts. Yeah. So if the service ceiling or the max operating altitude of the aircraft you're in uh, is can go above 25,000 feet then, yeah, you're, you're going to need an endorsement before you can fly that airplane. Well, recently we saw a headline that caught our eye here on the show. We at Legacy Airlines have been required for years now to go through a lot of sensitivity training and unconscious bias training and so on. Considering what we have all witnessed over the f- past few years with social issues dominating our headlines, this next story should be no surprise. In an article from Business Insider dated on June 24th by Grace Kay entitled, The FAA Wants the Airline Industry to Fight Decades of Sexism on Airplanes by Removing Words like Cockpit, 
airmen and unmanned. So we, we kind of hinted that this was going to be a topic on our next show, on our previous show. Uh, and there's been a little bit of a debate about, are we going overboard with, with all of these, you know, getting woke comments and changing everything? And there is some positivity to be seen and had from doing our best to make things better for all of us. But here in this article from The Insider, they stated that the airline industry may soon move towards promoting more inclusive language in an effort to increase diversity. On Wednesday, a Federal Aviation Administration Advisory Committee released a report recommending that airlines shift towards more gender-neutral language by removing words like those we mentioned from their lexicon. The FAA group recommended airlines replace airmen with aviator and cockpit with flight deck. It also said unmanned aerial systems should be uncrewed aerial systems or drone systems, to name a few of the recommendations. Research shows that the utilization of general neutral language can lead to a more inclusive environment that draws more people to the industry and help keep them there. This committee said that the move would mirror changes that other organizations have made to be more inclusive towards women. In 2006, NASA decided that all terminology used in the space program would be gender neutral. The recommendation from the FAA's Drone Advisory Committee comes as a result of a pushback from the Biden administration for more equality in aviation, an industry that has been primarily dominated by white men. While many women serve as flight attendants, there are very few female or minority pilots and flight engineers. To date, 94% of airline pilots and flight engineers are white males, according to data from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. By bringing more female representation into the industry, airlines could help combat a shortage of pilots that threatens to halt a post-pandemic boom in travel. Gender-neutral terminology will not target the lack of minority representation in the industry. In the past, the industry has benefited from the sexualization of women. In the 1950s through the 1960s, flight attendants, called stewardesses at the time, were hired based on looks and were required to be unmarried. (laughs) Axios reports. Most flight attendants at the time were forced to retire by the age of 35, according to the Association of Flight Attendants, or the CWA. Some airlines became known for their stewardesses and even used them in their advertising in the 1960s. Braniff International Airways' slogan was, Does your wife know you're flying with us? While Pan Am asked, How do you like your stewardess? By the 1970s, the airlines had flight attendants donning hot pants and go-go boots. National Airlines spent $9.5 million on a 1971 campaign that read, I'm Cheryl, fly me. The company later expanded the ads to include, I'm going to fly you (laughs) as you've never been flown before. (laughs) (laughs) And it claimed it saw a 23% jump in bookings. (laughs) Oh, my God. In the 80s, the industry began to gradually shift away from stringent physical requirements for flight attendants, as well as the sexual advertising schemes. Though the Association of Flight Attendants notes women in the industry have continued to struggle with representation as well as pay, the median annual wage for pilots is nearly double of a flight attendant's salary, according to federal data. Okay. In the past year, flight attendants have been forced to grapple with another set of issues. In May, Southwest Airlines flight attendant allegedly lost two teeth after a passenger assaulted her. We did cover that. That month, the FAA said it was seeing a spike in unruly aggressive behaviors on airlines, citing moments when passengers hit, yelled, and shoved flight attendants. And last week, several flight attendants told insiders Alana Akatar that they have faced unprecedented instances of violence and aggression in the air. So we start with a decades of sexism on airplanes and removing words like cockpit, airman, and unmanned from the vernacular. And okay, I get that. But then we end up with the sexism that the airlines used to sell. And now... 
we're going into the violence that is happening on the airplane. Okay, so this review panel board, I get it. And I'm all about, uh, if NASA is doing it, hey, I'm all for it. Let's get more women in aviation. I've been toting that line from the beginning of this podcast. We need to get more young people in aviation. We need to get more girls in the industry, and we need to get more minorities in the industry. And the way we're going to do that is to make it more inviting and to make it more fun and pleasurable and, and show people that this is a good career field. I don't think changing words in the vernacular are going to make a big, huge difference. It'll make a small difference. The one difference. word they're, they're not going to be able to change is the word human. <laughs> it's well, got the word man, human. <laughs> mankind. Yep. Humankind, right. but yes. even human has the word man in it. Exactly. So, ah, what whatever. are your thoughts, guys? I mean, the article Good is kind job. of all over the place, in but I found it very interesting because it's it's more of the same, more of this get wokeism that we have, not just in our industry but all over. Do you think it's going to make a big deal, a big difference? No. no. If I call it and a flight deck versus a cockpit, no. And here, my opinion on it is, where do these people get their time to, you know, come up with this stuff? I, I don't have time to uh, talk about how we need to change cockpit to flight deck. We need to take out the word man. You know, if it offends you, you clearly have some issues on the other side. Um, it's been like that for decades. Um it's it, it is what it is and um you know i i, I don't want to uh, uh offend anybody but on the same time i don't have the time to be debating on changing some name uh i i i, I don't care it's it's i have a life outside yeah. of work i got a life outside of uh uh, uh at everything we do so um you know uh make it inviting the pilots usually a type of personality. Um, and at the end of the day, can you fly an airplane? That, that's what it comes down to. Um, safe. Can you operate it safely? Can you uh, get along with people? That's the big thing. Can you hang out with people uh, on the, on the layovers? Um, yeah. And, and you know, that, that, that's what it comes down to. You just, you got to be nice to everybody, uh, treat others the way that you want to be treated. And uh and uh, every everything will be fine. So just yeah. uh, people on the high horse of changing all the names to a gender neutral. It's you know, are, are we going to start changing bathroom names? Or are we just going to call it restroom? You know, uh, and I know that's a big topic right now with the uh, uh, transgender uh, people. And you know, I it doesn't affect me if if that's what you want to do with your life then you know that that's fine um i'm not here to stop you as long as whatever makes you happy as a human being um but you know wh wh when's that conversation going to stop when are we exactly. going um it, it's an ongoing thing so I, I i think it's you know ridiculous that we're even talking about it um yeah so <laughs> that's my opinion on it but uh I'm, I'm sure to... others will disagree with me, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, because if you, if you really start creating a scene and saying, this is BS and, and I'm not willing for change, then there's only one outcome because you'd be in jail, you know, right. <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're, uh, truthfully, I, I hear what you're saying, Kyle, they're a lot of part of me thinks Really? Is this is this the conversation? Is this is is this what's making headlines? Is this is what the FA is spending money on, uh, re renaming things so that people won't be offended um, and try to bring in more people. I'm all for bringing in more people to the profession. That's the whole point of all of this. Um, I just think that there are better ways to do it than to hire a committee to. Right change offensive words in a book that is over 3000 pages long. Right. I, I do think too, Tony, you know, when a lot of people like at flight schools, for instance, when you start your flight training, it's, it's quite a bit of money. And if you 
don't have anybody in your family that has done it or has gone down that route, uh, looking at the upfront cost uh, is, is a big deal. And a lot of people don't want to go take out uh, about a hundred thousand dollar loan to get your flight training. Right. Um, now there's programs out there to do that today. However, that's still a lot of money for a loan. And over the course of your career, a lot of these young aviators, these, uh, uh younger generation, they don't look at the, the big picture on, how much you're going to make over the course of your career. You know, this is pennies uh, that you got to put up front. But uh, another flip side of that, the the reason the cost so high is because these airplanes now, these 172s, for instance, from Textron, you're spending half a million dollars yeah. on a 172. Right. And you say, well, wait a second. It's the same airplane that they've been making since the 50s. What has changed? And what has changed is um, you get all the lawyers involved, you get all the protections that if somebody crashes, I can't sue them because I did something stupid. And, uh, and like we we're talking earlier, everything's written in blood. So this $500,000 airplane that these flight schools are buying between, you know, Textron and Piper, um, they have to charge more uh, to pay the loan for the airplane per yeah. flight lesson. So everything's, right all the prices have gone up and everything's gone up. And uh, even though gas has gone up a little more, it flight training shouldn't cost a hundred thousand dollars. It, it, it should, it's, it's obscured. So, um, but, um, in order to get in to, uh, to end of this career, that's something that you're going to have to do. But at at the end of the day, um, over the course of, uh, how much you make and uh, a lot of variable variables involved it's it's worth doing but if you're not used to um if you don't have uh the, the guidance um or the mentorship um to be pointed in that right direction it's not going to be it's not going to look very good uh uh wanting to come in and start because if, if i'm gonna if i'm gonna if you tell somebody today a, a college student for instance um you know medical school you know you can go spend a hundred hundred thousand dollars and right off the bat once you get done with your uh, clinicals and whatnot um you're making 300 a year easy starting out yeah uh as a pilot stuff and that's yeah. why we've all seen the the raises the last 10 years i know especially you guys um uh, we're used to, what was it? 15,000 a year to start off. And you had this yeah. high expense and it just did the numbers didn't make sense to go, yeah. uh, yep. get to flight training and then go make $15,000 <laughs> commuting to New York city and not, you know, be, Live, living, living on, out of your suitcase in a crash exactly. pad and a bunk bed so, with five other people in your 10 by 10 room. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, uh, to, to answer the question, make it more inviting for everybody not just the certain group for everybody, it needs to become more affordable. Yeah. And, Definitely. and before that, uh, when that happens, I think we'll see a lot more, uh, minorities, um, all sort of, uh, different sex out there, I, you know, whatever you classify from. Um, but, uh, but until then, um, uh, I think we're going to continue to see the same group of people, um, coming yeah. through if you're not military trained um, th- to do that. And generally, somebody has some sort of background of it. Yep. Well, thank you for your input. Um, you know, you've made some, yeah. some wonderful points, especially about the affordability of what we do. I think that is how you're going to lure people in to this profession. And, you know, that's it, it was a boys' club. We've talked about the history of aviation and the airlines. It was a, a primarily a military pilot that was going to come to the airlines back in the 80s and 90s your interview Mm -hmm. was all right uh, where were you stationed and who's your ceo all right welcome aboard you know and so that's the way it was and and times like the even the airlines were pushing that whole we've got good looking flight attendants yeah you know it was a different time we're in a completely different time and we are now on the other side of that reality where if you say anything that's 
you, you might think it's funny or something and you're going to get labeled as a chauvinist or, you know, something. Yeah. And, and you're like, wait a minute, what? And so we're all kind of watching what we say and how we operate because we do want to make everyone feel comfortable so that we don't offend anyone. Um, but yeah, th- some of this is like overboard, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But just, just to bring one, one point up here, you know, re- from the article we just read, or you just read Tony, uh, it says in the 19 through the 1960s, flight attendants were called stewardesses at the time. Okay, that's what, 70, 60 years ago? Yeah. How many times do you hear passengers now Still say steward. call them stewardesses? Stewardesses. It doesn't matter. You know, and, and the flight attendants don't get offended when that when no. they're called a stewardess. Well, most I mean, don't. there's it just the word the word <laughs> stewardess isn't offensive. Right. But um you know, it's my point is, is that, you know, just changing the title or the word really isn't going to isn't going to bring about the change that I think what they're looking for. You know what I mean? It's just it's yeah. a, it's not enough to 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 make that kind of a difference. You know, if if there's if there are people out there um, and, and it. I hate to say this because I thank God it's a podcast and you know, we can say whatever the hell we want, but you know, let's take a transgender, you know, the lifestyle they're in, it's because that's the lifestyle they choose to, to be in. Now I'm sure there are transgender persons out there that would like to be in our industry. And if they would like to be, they're probably already are. They, and they are but and, the, and that right. video that we watch in uh, in training yeah. every year about uh, you know equality and gender equality and, and right. being a kinder gentler I mean it's been shoved down our throat for years yeah that legacy but my point is is that it, it's it's that if if they're not in it already or if they're not already pursuing it it they're they're not they're not in that kind of a mindset to do it yeah you know what I mean so it, they're not even gonna look here um you know and I don't think if you I don't think the 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 optics of the industry or of the you know the cockpit or the flight deck with the optics of having that outward you know kind of persona of not what we have now you're know, having that <laughs> transgender optics yeah. would would bring about another um form of you know hey are these people in the right frame of mind to be doing what we're doing because I mean, why would they go do what they did <laughs> to, 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 to change their selves to be the way they are now. And now they're going to operate our flight deck. And so you're saying that you're saying <laughs> that that shouldn't happen. The, I think the optics of it are kind of, are, are, are kind of can be excused. Ap- absolutely. So, you know, and I'm all for qualifiers. So if you qualify, yes, to do something and you're good at it and you're, you've satisfied all the regulations to do it. It shouldn't matter who you are, which are, what color you are, what, how, what your preference it is. It should not matter. It shouldn't, right. it shouldn't matter. Should it shouldn't never. define you. Okay. What should, should define you is how you qualifications. are. Are you, are yeah. you professional? Are you good at what you do? Do you, do right. you pass the test? understood so, so but, is the next thing the fa is going to look into are we going to take out um mandating who what company has to hire you know who um when you because when you put on a job application they ask they ask for your sex your race where you're from you know who your mother is they go down the list so how is that fair to the the rest of the population because it goes back to the best uh qualified person for that position so uh, i just you know with with the article and the way that they're going down it's it I, it's going to open up more cans of worms exactly um, yeah yeah and for- also there's one other thing i wanted to point out in the article that stood out in my mind and not to make it political but they did in the article and the quote is here, the recommendation from the FAA's Drone Advisory Committee comes as a result of a push from the Biden administration. Come on, man. <laughs> uh-huh. 
Uh huh. So, <laughs> so you got to be careful of the articles that you're gonna sit here and quote from because you know as we're we we picked this article on purpose because we wanted to have a yeah. discussion that was gonna yeah. create a little bit of fireworks yeah. here on the show. Because this is something, and I remember Roger last week goes, when you have that discussion, I'm not going to be there. That's not why yeah. Roger is not here this week. Right. I, I assure you, yeah. I had a conversation with him just yeah. about an hour ago, and he just couldn't make yeah. it today because he has family. Yeah. Uh, but, you know. To be to be clear for me, let me just say this real quick so nobody t- gets me wrong because I felt like I didn't come across clear. I'm all for, you know, making improvements and all inclusion, like you said, Tony, and like you, did, you said, Kyle, I'm all for that. I, I just think that um, there is a better way to do it. Yes. And this is not, Yes, this is definitely not it. You know, I have two daughters myself and I would, sh- I would love to see them doing, you know, anything they want. And it includes being a pilot, you know, uh, be being in a role that's predominantly dominated by males. You know, th- I would love that, but you know, I want them to do what they want to do. And if that's being a pilot, if that's being a uh, flight attendant, if that's, you know, being a school teacher, that's what they should be doing because, you know, that's what they want to do. I don't think they they need to have they're not, you know, anybody looks at at, at an airplane and they go, well, that's the cockpit. (laughs) You know, that's that's the name of it, (laughs) you know, and and it is an airman certificate. That's just what it is. Yeah. (laughs) You know. The, the Redskins will always be the Washington Redskins. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's going to be the Washington Redskins for the rest of its life, no matter well, what. <laughs> you know what offends me? People that get offended. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, folks, we'll yep. be right back after the break where we'll have more on <laughs> Flight 83 of the Squawk Den Podcast. <laughs> gentlemen welcome back to the program now if you've been following us here we've gotten a little bit of heated debate here about how there's a focus group that wants the fa to mandate that airlines change the names of things to make them more gender neutral and uh, we're all for change here and i hope you enjoyed the little bit of debate that three of us had here about you know what's right what's wrong and what's going to make a change now we've seen and those of us that have been around long enough have heard terms like affirmative action, and we know that you know affirmative action has been around since the 60s. I, I believe it was uh, JFK, President John F. Kennedy, who originally um, had put in an order in, into Congress to generate affirmative action. And what that was for was so that you could not discriminate when hiring somebody based on their race or creed or nationality or religion. Later on, Lyndon B. Johnson added uh, the, the, um, the gender into that affirmative action. And what happened was somewhere in the late 80s and early 90s, because of mandations with places like the or companies like firefighter fighter fighters and police departments and all these cities wanted to bring in more women and more minorities and they used under the guise of affirmative action to hire people that weren't necessarily the best qualified for the position they were just the best qualified amongst their gender or they were the best qualified amongst their their race and so they got thrown into the mix and then that made all the other people that were doing this profession whatever it was police department fire department saying wait a minute you're not hiring the best you're hiring based on race or sex or gender or what have you and so you're actually doing the opposite and it's there's a lot of backlash for that especially in the in the late 80s and 90s um so we have to be careful on how we proceed we want more women in aviation we want more people of minority in aviation. We want to have a more diverse crowd because with diversity comes ingenuity, comes uh, more opportunity to 
have a more equal, a more balanced airline, a more balanced industry, a more balanced aviation career field. We want that. We just want to make sure that it's done right and done in an efficient manner. And I hope that's what you listeners out there got from that. So we're all kind of excited because the masks, or at least the federal mask mandate, is set to expire in September. The goal that our current administration here in the United States had it by September. They wanted to have a percentage, the most numbers have changed, 70-something, 80%, 76%, whatever it is, of people that are in the U.S. that are vaccinated. And once we reach this arbitrary number, then the federal mask mandate would go away. And that was anticipated to disappear in September, or at least expire. And that looks like it's going to hold true. Recently, the United CEO went on a television program and said just that, that they're not anticipating that the mask mandate will be extended. I got some information here, uh, again, from the Aviation Business Administration Board, from thehill.com, and an article written by Joseph Coy on the 11th of July, it, entitled, A United CEO, My Guess Is... Airline mask mandate will expire in September. He goes on, uh, CEO Scott Kirby said on Sunday that he predicted that the mask mandate for airline passengers will be allowed to expire. In April, the Transportation Security Administration extended its mask order until September 13th for airports, airplanes, buses, and railways. Appearing on CBS's Face the Nation Sunday, Kirby told host John Dickerson, my guess is that the current government order expires on the 13th and our fingers are crossed. My guess is that it'll expire on the 13th, but let's wait and see. I have some audio saying, basically the saying, he's saying the same thing here. I'll just play that for you real quick. But in terms of what you see for travel, when when are the masks going to come off in the planes? When are people going <laughs> to stop worrying in the way that really, you know, it affects people at their fingertips in the airline travel business? When do you think that clears up? Yeah, well, one of the great things about flying on an airplane is it's literally, if you're going to be indoors with other people, it's the safest place to be, particularly because of the air filtration on the airplane. My guess is that the, the current government order expires on September 13th, and fingers crossed, my guess is it will expire uh, on September 13th, but we'll wait and see for sure. So that was Scott Kirby from uh, Face the Nation that he was on. And, you know, I got to say, I, I think that. Legacy Airlines and Delta and American and JetBlue and Southwest, I, I really do believe that they're looking to get rid of this whole mask thing as soon as it's safe to do so, as soon as it's no longer mandated. Um, our airplanes are clean. They're safe. We've been seeing how well they've been uh, just sanitizing everything on board the aircraft. I mean, people are going to get sick. I mean, sick is sick. There, there's other things other than COVID. There's the cold. There's the flu. We just talked about on the onset of this podcast how I came down with a, a respiratory virus uh, that was not COVID related at all. It happens. Um, yeah. But it doesn't mean we stop everything and we have to, and, and all this crap that's going on with the headlines every single day, another YouTube video pops up where some passenger just goes crazy <laughs> about something or other. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, ditching the masks. What do you think? Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. I can't wait to get rid of these things. I I've been enjoying a little bit of freedom, you know, being in training. I don't have to go into the work. And we, we had to wear them at the schoolhouse. But once you get inside, you know, I guess we're not supposed to. But once you get inside the uh, the classroom, there's only three guys there. And, and uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're 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 everybody's like take these things off or like yeah we're taking them off so and it only um, makes common sense exactly thank you donald uh it's the don but, he's, he's on cue <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it's it's just uh it's frustrating that um you know it's lasted this long um, and, and I understand there's some people out there that legitimately need to wear the mask. I mean, there's some people that have sensitive um, immune systems and stuff. And, and 
you know, we keep, we've been beating this dead horse for a year now, <laughs> you know, yeah, if, you got, over, if you're, yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, if it, 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 nothing's changed though. You know, if, if you're sensitive to that, that kind of stuff, you're going to take your precautions. That doesn't mean you need to stop everybody else's lives around you. And if you're going right. to be on an airplane, you're going to be on an airplane with other people. So, right. um, I do think that you if know. you have the sniffles, if you're not feeling well, number one is you shouldn't fly. Don't and I think that's the most important there. thing there. That's, that's is that we people need to, get out need there. to people need to take more responsibility for that aspect of it. If you know you're sick, you should not be um, traveling uh, with the general public, especially you know in a cramped airplane yeah. or a bus or a train or anything. And I think like if that. you are not feeling well, even if you're not sick, like if you just have the sniffles or you're like oh, I don't feel well, then put the mask on and walk around. No one's gonna like kick you out you know they're gonna say oh yeah. well they have a mask because whatever yeah and it would be really nice if doing. we got to the point where you know if you had a sniffle or if you had anything like that and since we're so you know sensitive with this covid stuff that you could do a rapid test right there get the results and know whether or not you're sick right in there with the with the covid at least and if you if you don't have it you're clear to travel if you do have it well then now you know and you can take the appropriate, uh, you know, actions then. So yeah. one thing out of the, uh, the whole COVID stuff this last year, it just goes to show you how many people went somewhere sick and that's what it came down to. Um, yeah. you know, if you're sick, stay home. You, nobody's forcing you to go. Definitely. Um, and, and one thing that, uh, uh, I know the airlines pushed for it, uh, for the first round of, uh, uh government help was, uh, how safe the airplane was with the the airflow of the uh, uh, the airplane, the HEPTA filters on the yeah. pressurization system. No, nobody quite understood how it worked. So when you were talking about it to a uh, a customer on how it works, um, you, you tell them this is the the cleanest air you're you're ever going to have on public transportation. You get a new set of air every two minutes uh, going through the airplane. So it, even though you had 200 people on the airplane, uh, it's constantly moving. It's not sitting there. Um, so um, between that and the the sanitation of the airplanes, I think the all these airplanes, this is the cleanest that they've ever been ever yeah. Yeah. Um, going forward with it. And I think that's it's probably going to be the new, the new normal, but they're going to take 20 minutes to clean the airplane down. And, um, that in the, the, the air system, um, safest place to be. But, uh, once again, it comes down to, if you're sick, stay home. Um, you, you, you know, you gotta be an adult. Don't use your, uh, uh, sick time for vacation, use it when you're actually sick and, uh, and, and go with it. And that, I, I think that's, what's gonna, uh, uh, get the trust back into everybody flying again. Yeah. Yeah, well said. Yeah. Well, the next topic I wanted to talk about, um, we've seen a lot of this information on the aviation boards and forums, but we really haven't seen much on this in mainstream media. And this is a uh, reference to the 737 aircraft that actually ditched in the Pacific Ocean a couple weeks ago uh, coming out of Honolulu. So, you know, this is, was a Rotas Express Boeing 737-200 cargo aircraft. It was operated by Transair Flight 810. And after takeoff from Honolulu, they were supposed to do a relatively short flight from Honolulu to Maui. And right after takeoff, they were experiencing some engine trouble. This was, happened on July 2nd. And it's in a very interesting accident, and both pilots have survived. Uh, but what we're, as pilots, interested in is, you know, this is such a rare occurrence. They didn't hit birds. They had engine problems. How, what's, the, what's the probability of having two engines fail on departure on a short flight where you know you're not going to be that heavy that you have to dump fuel to come back? So, Because it's going to be a short flight anyway. Um, so... Luckily, on the aviation information board that uh, Kyle runs, he, he puts these great articles. He even had the pictures from the wreckage at the bottom of the ocean, about 430 feet down. Um, so the best article that I saw, and Kyle, if you, if you have another resource, let me know. But the one I saw was from actually ForbesAlert.com. It's an Australian 
side of Forbes, an article by Michael V about two weeks ago, and it was entitled, It's Running Very Hot, It Doesn't Look Good, The Moment Boeing 737 Cargo Plane Ditches Off Honolulu. We have some uh, infrared uh, photos of the rescue. You can see the helicopter. You can see the two um, people you know, floating in the water there in the raft. And, and so it's just an amazing chain of events. The article indicates that both engines of this Boeing 737-200 cargo plane failed in the early hours of Friday off the coast of Hawaii, forcing the emergency landing in a sea or in the sea as the pilots radioed air traffic control to inform them that they had lost one engine and the second one appeared to be failing as it was running very hot. And it doesn't look good here. Um, that's what they were quoted as saying. In just the latest drama to befall Boeing, the two pilots, 150, the other 58, were rescued from the sea by the Coast Guard. One sustained serious injuries and was airlifted to the hospital. The second, less severely harmed, was transported back to land by a boat. The plane was operated by Rodas Aviation Incorporated, which does business as Transair. Transair is one of Hawaii's largest air carriers and has been in business since 1982. The, uh, the recording was posted on Live ATC. I actually have a little bit of that. Um, a little bit later here, several minutes after the pilot reported, we lost the number one engine. We're coming straight to the airport. Uh, we're going to need a fire department. There's a chance we're going to lose the other engine. It's running very hot. It doesn't look good here. You may want to let the Coast Guard know as well. I mean, these are radio transmissions that are every pilot's worst nightmare. The loss of both engines was on a 46-year-old airplane, a workhorse for transatlantic passenger travel that has sparked some serious alarms. There are some images in this article. I'll put the link in the show notes. Um, it was around 2 a.m. when the helicopter airlifted the one pilot uh, from the water, and both crew members are alive, and in crit one was in critical condition the last uh, that was reported. So. Yeah, some pretty crazy yeah. stuff here. Now, these engines were the old the 200 series little, we call them jet. screamer jet. Yeah, turbo jet. JT-8Ds. Yep. Yeah, and they're too loud for most airports, but in Hawaii, they allow them to, to operate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wondering what happened. You know, what was the uh, scenario there? Obviously, we'll never know. NTSB will be the final uh, say on all that stuff. But, you know, just thinking about me operating the 737-800, you know, they, they have the, uh, the CF-56-7 engines in them, uh, which is totally different. But um, the, uh, you know, it could have been a weight, you know, were they heavy? Uh, blew a motor. Push the other one too hard, too hot, you know, performance thing, yeah. um, you know, over, you know, if they were following procedures as supposed to, you know, save you and, and that's not supposed to happen, you know, place the uh, motors into MCT, max continuous thrust, and uh, that way you don't over, over speed or overheat the engine. Um, however, you know, if they were fighting for altitude, fighting for airspeed, obviously it just happened after takeoff. Um, according to, to the uh, audio that I heard. Uh -huh. um, so they were probably, uh, you know, I think they were low level. I think it was like 2,000 feet when they were um, fighting this thing. So, you know, they were probably trying to get as much as they could out of the engines, and they may not have been in MCT because they were trying to, you know, get the maximum performance out of the engine. Yeah. So um, could it have been a result of a proper, you know, improper planning as far as weight, performance, um, you never know. I mean, how do you, how do these operators operate? You know, we, we, a lot of times we find out and not saying that this was the case, but a lot of times we find out after the fact that, uh, you know, there were things that were incorrectly, you know, done, whether it been, you know, the weight and balance, uh, performance or non-standard practices, uh, that, that could, could have caused this. So, uh, I, you know, being a pilot myself, I hope it wasn't the, uh, the pilot's fault. Cause I'd hate to see, you know, these guys, you know, cause another change in our FM one or, 
sure. <laughs> the way we operate, you know, hopefully they did things and, you know, they survived. So, you know, they, they got something to talk about and walk away from, but, um, you know, and I'm thinking about other things too. I mean, there was a, a I think it was Bob Hoover tells this story and not to say that this happened to, to the, to Rhodes aviation, but I remember it was, I think it was Bob Hoover. And, and if you guys know the story, back me up, but he, uh, he tells a story about, um, right before an air show he was about to do, he had the fuel boy come up and fill up his airplane. And he has that, uh, uh, was that that turbo, uh, uh, turbo, um, commander, uh, commander. Thank you. Um, so the fuel boy comes up and fills up his airplane right before the show. And one of the things Bob Hoover does in the show is he does that, you know, he kills the engine and he trades off the airspeed and the energy of the airplane and does loops and comes back around and lands it with the engines completely dead. Uh, you know, every, most people know that Bob Hoover was a test pilot and all, all this stuff. So this guy's, you know, extremely skilled aviator. Um, well, in this particular case, uh, he took off and he was getting ready to start his maneuver and both engines just quit. So like it was nothing to him. He just came back and landed and glided, declared emergency and landed. Well, come to find out during the investigation, the fuel boy put the wrong gas in his airplane. Ugh. And the, the, the fuel boy didn't realize it was a turbo commander, which needed, you know, the JP eight. And he put in, you know, 100 low lead yeah. into the, into the airplane. So the airplane, you know, you know, engines quit and you know thankfully bob having the you know the the greatest sense of aviation saying hey you know what that's the exact person i want refueling my airplane the next time because he'll never, never make that make mistake that again mistake. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. but i'm thinking you know here we are looking at the hawaii thing was this could have been a could have been a fuel a fuel factor yeah. You know, was there something wrong with the gas? Was it the wrong gas? I mean, it's hard to hard to mess that up with a with you know in in the industry that we're in with you know seven thirty sevens and sure. Airbuses and everything. But yeah, what was the maintenance on that aircraft? Did, did that yeah. that aircraft come off a maintenance check recently? Did they do some kind of engine yeah. cleaning procedure that? might have had some residual cleaning agent in there that burns extremely hot that's how it cleans yeah. the engine so i mean there's so many factors so that, many things and the ntsb will uncover it and that's what we look forward to to hearing about yeah. it probably will take about a year that's usually the yeah. time frame the ntsb puts upon itself to to come yeah. to a conclusion they have not been able to remove the black box and the voice recorders yet because of the depth of the fuselage right uh, then so they're they're working out a plan as we speak the last i read um, Kyle was very good to find the NTSB photos that were published. Uh, that I'll put a link in the show notes for that. Uh, they're amazing pictures. Uh, the fuselage is, you know, relatively in good uh, p uh, pieces there. The, the cockpit yeah. is all one piece. Um, so I'll be looking forward to, to finding out more. I did promise uh, we'd play a little bit of audio. I do have some audio. I believe this is from the rescue attempt here from live ATC. And this is going to bring up some some yeah, more interesting discussion. Six five four four six five four five. six five four four ATF approach on all And ATF six five four four did not catch that. So six five four four ATF approach on the Lulu altimeter three zero zero two. Three zero zero two for so sorry, six five four four. Good evening, sir. Uh, we have just departed Kalalua. Currently headed southeast, 1,200. Um, I'm question to know if you have any plan information on a possible down there across the surface. Coast Guard 6544, IDEN, and uh, stay out to the Arcland and the Bravo Air Space, southwest of Honolulu Airport, radar contact. So this is the Coast Guard miles, helicopter so departing Honolulu. When they're needed, cleared into the Bravo below, airspace. They're they're crew, flying southeast bound, which is uh, the at the last known port. And information port. that we had was off Honolulu Airport, two four nine radial. Oh, why did it stop? I was kind of hoping you had the audio of the actual emergency. I couldn't find it. So. Yeah. I think I could find it. Let me see if I can find it real quick, because that that also brings up another. If you listen to the audio of the actual emergency, I don't know if you heard it, Kyle or or uh, you, Tony. The the uh, the transmissions between ATC and the the pilots uh, were were horrible. I mean, it was 
just a cluster. It was horrible. And, and then to make things worse, there was a second car. Uh, I forget the name of the, the company, Rota Cargo plane flying around with a similar call sign. Uh. So they were stepping on each other, answering each other's uh, radio calls while this guy was had. And, and the problem was, it was the, the, the aircraft in the emergency declared the emergency once with one time he they said emergency, maybe twice. I'm in an emergency. Emer- and that was it. Uh, and both times they were kind of stepped on. So the controller, I think they heard it once, but they were, you know how controllers are sometimes. They're like, uh, was what who who was what doing doing what? You know, like they they didn't really acknowledge the emergency. Get the words out. Mayday, mayday, mayday. That gets everybody's attention. If you say it three times, even if you're kind of blocked, mayday is an easy word to understand. Um, and if you listen to this transmission, it, it'll piss you off because no word you f- does anybody realize they're in an emergency until the plane's almost in the water. I, I yeah, actually, I found it. it. Let's see if uh, if we have time here. Let's let's see what we hear. Yeah, take a listen. Have you heard it yet, Kyle? Eight ten, we have emergency stop by. Going on the 220 heading. Rose Express 810, radar contact, fly heading of 100 to John Vister 2, resume navigation. 820 has emergency, going to 220 heading, stand by. So, first he interrupted ATC. 2964, we cannot comply with the last zone. UBS 2964, have you no problem, you've got the full line. Thank you. Rose Express 809, cleared visual approach runway 4 right, number 2, caution, weight turbulence behind a heavy MD-11 short funnel, runway 4 right, quit a land, change my frequency, 118.1. So, single controller working two different frequencies. That's another thing that happens late at night. Yeah, Rose Express 810, radar contact, turn left, heading 090, join Victor 2, resume navigation, climb and maintain 13,000, stay altitude. Okay, rooms 810, radio check, how do you read? Express 810, loud and clear, how do you hear? Turn left, heading 180. Okay, rooms 810, we've lost an engine. We are on the 220, heading. Now I say again, heading 240. Okay, 240, heading rooms 810. No, roads 809, roads 809, left 240. 240 now, roads 809. Rose Express 810, you're uh, cleared visual approach runway 4 right, you can turn in towards the airport. Okay, Rose 810, we're going to have to run a checklist if we can get a delay of access. Go heading and uh, just keep me advised and maintain uh, 2000 if that's the altitude you'd like. Okay, 2000 is good for now, we'll stay around 15 miles from the airport. And I'll maintain 2000. Taxi to parking via Charlie. To park it via Charlie, UPS 2964. And Rose Express 809, uh, can you make the turn back in now to the airport? Company's not coming in quite yet. Okay, we are coming back towards the airport, heading 360 now, Rose Express 809. Rose Express 809, you're still cleared for the visual approach to runway 4 right, runway 4 right, quit a land. 4 right, clear to that, Rose 809. And Rose Express 810, uh, when you get a chance, uh, can I get. Yeah, the nature of the emergency, I know you set an engine out. Which one, uh, how many souls on board, and fuel? Okay, all that is good. We'll give you all that in a little bit, a little bit, Rose, uh, 810. You're ready. So, so okay, there's a Rose 809 and Rose 810. That was confusing. They were blocking each other for a lot of the transmissions. That's not bad, and that's part of the controller, too. Why did, was she doing this? blocking him yeah see i think also what was happening was is in his head he's trying to get out information but he's stringing a lot of information on to you know numerous blitz of information along and and the controller is just responding to the first you know uh request and well, not listening to right, the the right and I'm just going to let this audio play. It's only about five minutes yeah. long. We were already three minutes into it. Yeah. So, um, and so, yeah, while they're not talking, you're right. They, they were overwhelming the communications. Plus, she's working multiple frequencies. Yeah. Once you have an, an, a Mayday aircraft, 
then there should be another controller to take over everything else so that you can concentrate on the Mayday aircraft. And instead of returning immediately, they've elected to get vectors or holding patterns or circles about 15 miles from the airport. And you can see their flight path is they get out about 15 miles and they start turning back and they didn't make it. It's potential that if they would have just... We could have made it. Started to yeah. turn back and run whatever they could and get the airplane, focus on getting the airplane yeah, on the ground. Yeah. Express 810, hello, sir. Yeah, we're getting taking your tent to the right, uh, towards the airport. We're not ready to land yet, though. Express 810, uh, flight heading is 250. 250, Rose 810. And we've been talking about when you have an emergency, you really have time, unless. You have a dual engine fire, or a dual engine failure, an engine fire, uh, or, or you just, the airplane, the flight controls aren't working can't for fly. whatever. You can't fly the airplane. In those scenarios, you get it on the ground ASAP. Rose 810 would like to come to the airport now. Rose Express 810, Roger, confirm you still have the airport in sight. Turn and they're blocking each other. That's the worst thing that can happen. Slow it down. Express 810, turn right, heading 020. Confirm you still have the airport in sight. Negative, we don't have the airport. Express 810, Express 810, fly heading of 020. And would you like to intercept the localizer or do you want vectors? Uh, vectors straight to the airport. We want to look at the airport. 040. Uh, give me, say again, the road 010. 040, heading roads Express 810. So here's the part where they do the, the And Rose Express 810, uh, is it two souls on board and also how much fuel remaining? Uh, Rose 810, stop by. So clearly they're overwhelmed because they can't get these simple things out. They're doing other, they're task saturated is what it sounds like. Big time. To me. And if, um, they, if they're losing both engines, they may have lost generators, so they may be working on emergency power right now and the lighting would be horrible in a dash 200. Yeah. Yeah, and so here they are, they're turning around, they give them a radar vector, and according to the flight path, this flight is not going to last much longer. Thank God these guys mm -hmm. survived it. Or should I say, these aviators. I shouldn't yeah, assume. Right. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm just surprised that they never gave a mayday call. And if you're getting stepped on like that, you know, you need to speak up and say, hey, mayday, 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 emergency aircraft, you know, and uh, as we all know, eat, head back Rose to the Express airport. 810, fly heading of 050. 050, Rose Express 810. Very Rose interesting. Express 809, I need you to roll all the way to the end, please. All the, all the way to the end, turn right and hold short of runway 8 left on Charlie. And it's interesting audio because we're, we haven't... Rose Express 809, hold short of runway 8 left on Charlie. We haven't modified anything yet on this audio, and, and we can see that. Express 809, I'm not hearing anything. We'll hold short of runway 8 left on Charlie. Hold short of runway 8 left on Charlie, Rose Express 809. Thank you. Lost 56, runway 8 left, cleared for takeoff. 8 left, cleared for takeoff, Lost 56. You have an emergency aircraft. Okay, Rose 810, now situation, we've lost number yeah, one but... engine, and um, we're coming straight to the airport. We're going to need the fire department as a chance. We're going to lose the other engine, too. It's running very hot. And uh, speed is um, we're pretty low on the speed. It doesn't look, out, look good out here. You might want to let the food go know as well. And uh, we don't have any hazmat. And uh, fuel is about two hours of fuel. And Rose Express 810, how many people are on board? Uh, two of us. Rose Express 810, Roger. Do you have the airport in sight? We're not going to make it. Rose Express 810, do you have the airport in sight? Negative. Oh, and Rose Express 810, low altitude alert. Uh, low altitude alert. Are you able to climb at all? No, negative. Rose Express 810, Roger. Voice Proceed change. direct to the airport and you are cleared to land any runway. We need a heading. Rose Express 810, heading 060. 060. Rose Express 810, the trucks are rolling. You want to let the Coast Guard know as well? Coast Guard. Say that again? Uh, can you let the Coast Guard know? We're going to maintain altitude. We will. So at that point, who was flying the airplane? 
was yeah. the FO and, uh, um, you know, uh, those freight companies hire low time co-pilots. Um, you know, I don't want to get ahead of the NTS- NTSB like we were talking about earlier, but since it's an old airplane maintenance, uh, that number one cause is generally those, those types of companies, you know, they're trying to cut costs somewhere and, you know, not, might not be the best maintenance practices. And then two, um, it sounded like the captain uh, uh, flying the airplane and uh, you know, what was the FO doing that he's missing the calls or who's running the, you know, if he's running the checklist at some point, um, why is the captain uh, answering his calls? Um, and then three, um, their type of training, um, you know, I, I don't know if it's an in-house training. I don't know if they go to a third party to do training. Um, cause I, I, I can, I can contest to this, uh, from my corporate experience, uh, they want you to run the checklist, uh, unless you're on fire immediately, immediately need to get the back, get back to the airport. Um, you know, uh, well, is that their company procedures? We, we you know, all this is going to come out in the, the NTSB. Um, but, uh, I'm, I'm going to be curious to see, um, uh, between the maintenance and how much flight experience, uh, at least the FO had, because the captain, he could have been single pilot. Uh, you know, you never know. Uh, and we've seen oh, it yeah. on, on, uh, these, uh, 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 foreign carriers, um, that you're single pilot and you got somebody just occupying the seat. That's not actually, um, there to help out your yeah. babysitting. And so you don't know what the other pilot's going to do. And, you know, is he running the checklist at this point? Is he not running it fast enough? Does he know what he's looking at? Um, it gets back to the training aspect of it on um, not only experience level, but how well he was trained. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that goes the other way, too, where we, yeah. we see instances where the first officer is not flying. So in a situation like that, at our company, at least, the minute you have any kind of discrepancy, whether that be an, an ECAM message or something happening, immediately the first thing that anybody does, the, fl- the pilot flying says, my aircraft, my radios, and the pilot monitoring then reads out either the ECAM message or, uh, you know, time permitting, enunciates the what the mm-hmm. issue is. And then they're the ones that are running through a checklist. So if the person on the radio that we heard the most at first it sounded like they had a mask on, which could cause oxygen deprivation, decision-making problems. Who knows? But that's neither here nor there. It sounded like that to me, my opinion. Um, and if that person was the one talking on the radio, they were talking on the radio throughout from before the incident, during the incident, and then there was some interjection by a second pilot. Um, Maybe that was the pilot who was flying, who was then talking on the radio as well. It sounded to me like the pilot flying was the one in the left seat, and then that's the second voice we heard. And the pilot monitoring was probably, I'm guessing, only only speculation here, is possibly the FO, and he was overwhelmed because he's talking on the radio and trying to run a checklist, probably. I'm, I'm Again, the NTSB... Re- Report will uncover it if they can recover the voice recorder and uh, right. and it's not damaged. Um, so yeah, there's so many things wrong with that audio. The both both from the the crew and from the air traffic controller as well. I mean, there was a lot of stepping on top of each other. Uh, we've as flight instructors, all three of us have been uh, in some way involved with that, and we're always say the same thing. Uh, slow down, be direct, be concise. Uh, don't try to rush because if you make a mistake, now you're, you're, you're wasting valuable time trying to correct what you just did and go back two steps to go back forward or a step. And so it just becomes all, pardon the expression, but asses and elbows in the flight deck. And, uh, you know, that audio is so frustrating to hear. Um, yep. I'm just so happy that, that they survived. And I hope that we get some answers from this that, makes it just safer in the future and how important it is to have good crm in the cockpit you know for for this and good training because as you can tell 
this 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 could have gone better as far as communications go. Um, yeah, yeah, that <laughs> was that was hard. That was hard to listen to. You listen to that, and you listen to the Sully ditching in the water. What a stark con. Seriously, a stark contrast. Yeah, in in the difference in in experience, you can tell in the experience level and and training was completely different than what you just heard. Absolutely. And, and you know, yeah. speaking of, thank you. What an amazing transition, Rob. Uh, yeah. <laughs> speaking of ditching, you know Sully was not the first one to pull off a zero <laughs> fatality ditching. Uh, not to take away from the miracle flight and the wonderful outcome of that day, but recently Kyle found a fantastic uh, article uh, about Captain Richard Ogg. And uh, he posted it on the Aviation Information or Business Information Board on Facebook. And I I looked at it and I kind of saved it. And I was looking at this cargo incident and it's another ditching. And I just thought, wow, let's let's focus on some positive information here. <laughs> you know, and that wonderful day, uh, Captain Og and his open ocean ditching on a flight from San Francisco to Honolulu that had a similar outcome to the Miracle Flight, that happened 73 years before the Hudson ditching. This story was published on August 2nd of 2015. It was published in avgeekery.com. The title of the article is Pan Am Flight 6 Safely Ditched in the Ocean 53 Years Before Sully Ditched in the Hudson. And we just wanted to focus a little bit on that today. The article goes on to state that we all know Sully became a hero when he ditched his U.S. Airways Airbus A320 in the Hudson River after bird strikes took out both engines on flight 1549 in 2009. But Sully was not the first pilot to ditch an airliner and not lose a passenger or crew member. One of the lesser known but equally amazing instances of a ditching with all souls on board surviving the event occurred on October 16th. 1956, when a Pan Am American World Airways Boeing 377 Stratocaster flying as Pan Am Flight 6 was forced to ditch in the open ocean, roughly about halfway between Honolulu and San Francisco. And thanks to a YouTuber, a Periscope film page, they uploaded a Coast Guard film about Flight 6. Uh, the film itself is, uh, I don't want to play it because I'm sure there's some kind of copyright there because it's a produced film, uh, but I'll put the link of the article in the show notes. Uh, the flight, it originally uh, left Philadelphia as a DC-6B and proceeded to Honolulu after stopping in San Francisco. After the flight stopped in San Francisco, it switched equipment to a 377 Clipper Sovereign of the Skies for the trip back to San Fran. Just after passing the decision point, and we've talked about ETOPS flights before, they experienced engine problems that forced the crew to shut down first one and later the other outboard Pratt & Whitley R4360 engines, one and four. Unable to make San Francisco or return to Honolulu due to reduced power and the windmilling prop on number one, a mayday call was broadcast by the crew. Maintaining the United States Coast Guard Mid-Pacific Vigil at Ocean Station November, that night was a U.S. Owasco-class Coast Guard cutter Ponch train HWEC-70. Fortunately for the passengers and crew of Flight 6, the Pontchartrain was able to prepare to assist the survivors after the Sovereign ditched. During the previous year, a 377 had been forced to ditch off the Oregon coast. The 37 was Pan Am 845-26. I'm not sure what that means. That aircraft broke up when the tail section broke off the airframe on initial impact. The crew of the Sovereign moved all passengers forward so the tail was empty of passengers. The after-flying orbits around the uh, Pontchartrain until sunrise in order to burn off fuel, which would allow the plane to float longer on the water. The pilots flew several practice approaches in order to determine the lowest possible speed at which the 377 would remain controllable for ditching. At 0540, early local time, the pilot command, Richard Org, radioed the Pontchartrain 
saying that he was preparing to dish the aircraft in order to align the approach of the 377 into the wind for the lowest possible approach speed and to help Og determine his height above the water the Pachacharian used firefighting foam to indicate 315 degrees on the surface of the Pacific. A veteran pilot with more than 13,000 flight hours over 20 years in the air, Og made his approach and ditched at 0615 local time. All on board, the Sovereign survived the ditching with minimal injuries, despite the aircraft breaking into two large pieces of just aft of the wing trailing edge after one wing hit a swell and caused the 377 to rotate. The crew and the passengers deployed three life rafts. Everyone was into life rafts within minutes and the Pontchartarian's crew assisted with boats from the cutter. By the time the wreckage sank 20 minutes after impact, all sorts on board the Sovereign were in the uh, Coast Guard care. The uh, Poncha train bore the passengers of Flight 6 to their original destination, San Francisco. Several days later, the flight crew of the Sovereign of the Seas was 43-year-old pilot and card-carrying badass Captain Richard N. Ogg and 40-year-old First Officer George L. Hacker. 31-year-old navigator Richard L. Brown, 30-year-old flight engineer Frank Garcia Jr., and 30-year-old purser Patricia Reynolds, assisted by 24-year-old stewardess Mary Ellen Daniel and 23-year-old stewardess Catherine S. Arkai. What an amazing story. You know, we, we forget about all of those that came before us and survived these really amazing ditching and crashing, and they did it right. And yeah. there's something to be said about knowing your history. A lot of us in aviation, you know, we know we love to fly. We get in the airplane, we train, we, you know, we work on our ratings, we get our pilot certificates and, you know, we work on everything and we get in there and we work our butts off to get a job. And, and then we work there for years and maybe decades and then move on and fly bigger and better things. But we rarely take the time to look back and see all of the amazing we hear about the the major crashes we hear about the sullies of the world we hear about you know all the modern stuff but do we really go back and really learn about the history of what we do of our profession and i want to say thank you to Kyle for finding that article and, and posting it because i had no idea that this had happened and it was really nice to to kind of see it. And again, the link will be in the show notes. You'll see this Coast Guard video. It's, it's I think, about 15 minutes long. It's a, actually a pretty good uh, video. I was watching it right before the show. Um, and uh, it's clearly produced. Um, so the voiceover is, is funny. It's a very old-timey news article kind of thing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, really cool, really cool event. And uh, thank you for sharing that. No problem. Yeah, but very neat article. Stuff. Yeah, good stuff. I thought it's awesome how they uh, they used the firefighting foam so that they can give them, you know, Guidance. help the pilots. Yep. Yeah, get, let them know which way the wind is going and, and uh, give them a little help with depth perception because, you know, we don't right. land airplanes on the ocean that often. No. So, no. wow, that is that is awesome CRM right there. Just how do you think about how much coordination that went into that, you know, totally. back, back when on the radio between, you know, uh, uh, twenty one five and uh, Coast Guard and right. ATC and, and probably then, on RF frequency. Uh, yeah, RF. So, you know, oh my then, gosh! Yeah, you know, and then yeah. uh, uh, getting together with the crew. Through you know, you had the flight engineer and the. Uh, well, and also, how do you give them your location? Lat right. long. You don't. You know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Lat I'm, long. That's that's what we got, and you know we're using our our sextant uh, to navigate because right. look at the time. You know, right. it's early in the morning, so that you know they don't have any. Uh, Anything nope. to really go well, by. They had a, so. a navigator that was navigator, sitting there yeah. plotting and an engineer. doing circle tick plotting. Circle and tick. You know, we learned yep. about that on when we're doing our training circle for our tick. over the ocean yep. etops. But you circle and tick. Now, if I had a circle and tick today, man, I'd have a hard time of it. I just look down at the FMS and find out what my GPS location is, you know. And if I yeah. had to go back and and I was trained how to do it, I could do it. But it's yeah. not something I do every day. 
so right. yeah, these guys, my hats off to them for, and and then the yeah. flight engineer, and they just coordinated that, and you know, part Those of that guys was luck, are but real most of it aviators. Was, yep, most of it was yep. real aviators, just badassery, nice. as the article said. It, totally, <laughs> yeah. Hail, hail to the crew. It's awesome. I also want to take a moment here as we're wrapping up the show uh, to say thank you to the Airline Pilot Guy podcast. Um, I have been listening to them for quite some time. I'm a big fan, uh, and they have a podcast. It's very popular. Sometimes it's even number one uh, for aviation podcasts in the U.S. Um, They've been on the air a long time, and they talk about a lot of this stuff, the accident investigations. They talk about listener feedback and they answer questions and they even do these wonderful stories at the, towards the end of their podcast, the old pilot plane tales. Um, and I've been, uh, communicating with them, sending them feedback. And, you know, I love receiving feedback. Um, I also like giving feedback. Um, it's a great community, the podcast community. Everybody is so just really cool. And they recently, uh, aired one of my audio feedbacks that I sent them. Um, and I, I didn't even know they did it. I, I was kind of, I sent it in and I didn't, I got busy with all the flying and then the whole road trip. And I didn't listen to podcasts for a while. Cause, uh, I'm actually not allowed to listen to podcasts when I'm driving with my family. My, my daughter is like, not a podcast dad. And I was like, okay, fine. We'll just listen to whatever's your K-pop, whatever. <laughs> <I don't care. laughs> so, uh, so we, I, uh, I was, on the short drive now to Ontario airport the other day. And I was listening to episode 478 of the APG, the airline pilot guy podcast, creepy gobbledygook is the title of that one. And yeah, about an hour and 40 minutes into it, they, they aired my, my feedback. And what I told them was how I appreciated that they mentioned the Sherry Fontenick in Miami. Um, and when they were talking about it, it brought back so many memories. You remember that Rob going into the Sherry? Totally. When we were flying yeah, for yeah. Sandpiper and those long layovers yeah. at the Sherry, uh, 18, 20 hour layovers and yeah, sitting there on the pool so deck. Awesome. And you could always tell the captains cause they had, they were holding the newspaper, uh, trying to cover yeah. up the fact that all they're doing is staring at the pretty girls and the, you could tell cause the newspapers would be upside down. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. For me, that was, uh, it was the same kind of feeling, you know, it, it brings back when, when I first experienced the Sherry, um, in, in my mind, that is, that was the last of the old way that aviation that was age. as yeah. far as overnight and golden age. So you, you, we kind of got a taste of it, a small taste of it. And, and it felt like another country all, also altogether because, you know, you're kind of in South Miami, which is kind of like being in, you know, Cuba or Latin America. Um, so, uh, yeah, I totally get it. So when they talk about it, you know, you bring back, oh my God, that was, the, you know, one of the most fun layovers i've ever had and you know it's totally different from going to you know i I said this last podcast so i apologize because it's the only one that sticks out in my mind but garden city kansas you know (laughs) (laughs) you're gonna get a letter from the mayor of garden city yeah i like man it's (laughs) not not the same (laughs) it's not the same and i enjoy it but not not as much as i do miami Uh, or the sherry yeah well, you know, I just, again, guys, thank you so much. Kyle, did, did you ever get a chance to stay at any of these kind of hotels? Did you stay at the Sherry ever? No. Yeah. Ah. Uh, no, you guys got to remember, before my airline career, I was a corporate guy. We were, we were staying at the Ritz. Everything was a company, <laughs> company paid for. Uh, so, you yeah. know. So you had all your these, great coupon with you. Yeah, yes. all, all these uh, stories that you guys bring up back when I was like, what are you guys talking yeah. about? Lifestyles of the rich and famous. What was the name of that guy? Yeah. <laughs> Room service pool, you know. Uh, yeah. but, but, uh, uh, you know. And now you're slumming it at the All Legacy inclusive. Airlines. Exactly. <laughs> I, think the fly, I think the flight attendants still stay there. We don't even get really? the points. I think so. Oh. Yeah, I know. Doesn't that suck? <laughs> no, I'm serious. I think the flight attendants still stay there. At the Sherry? Um, yep. Oh, wow. I do. Yep. Well, Crazy. so what's next, guys? Uh, Rob, you've got, uh, you were telling us you have some final simulator events happening this week on uh, Saturday and Sunday, is it? Yeah. So I go back to training on Thursday. So I'm on, I'm on my uh, days off. So we get two days off. So Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, so Thursday head back for, um, I have to actually have to do security training first. Uh-huh. That's part of the, uh, recurrent, uh-huh. um, recurrent training, which this, this whole training session resets my, uh, my new AQ what is it? AQP 12, 12 or 24. 12, yeah. 
R12. So, um, so that's required. Um, so anyway, start Thursday simulators, um, Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday is the uh, maneuvers validation mm -hmm. and Monday is the, um, LOE or loft. Oh, good. So, so have you done human factors yet or you're going to do that this week? I think that's part of the, I think that's kind of, Actually, I don't even know human factors. Because if you're going to do part R12, of, that's going to be human factor. That's a great class. I, I, we talked about that uh, when I was. That, going that may it. have been. That may be covered in the uh, in the in the um, quarterly training, which we have to do. So I don't know. Oh. It's not in my schedule. Okay. So, Speaking of, yeah, this I, this year's uh, yeah. or this uh, quarter's training. Um, I need to look get it started. I guess it just came out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but. Uh, yeah. They they talk about the 737 versus light pole incident, and they use that oh, as boy. part of the training event. Um, <laughs> we talked about that here on the show, and yeah, it's yeah. it's a great training tool. That's why we talk about things. Yeah, yeah it could happen to anybody. It could happen sure. to anyone. Yep. Yeah. And whenever you guys get a chance, check out the latest CCI message about uh, the max braking on the Airbus. It's a pretty good one. Oh. <laughs> were people using it for other than takeoff? Just came out. Just came out. Well, you guys were on a break. Uh, um, who oh, reads their emails on the days off, Rob? I just while, well, you're, I have while my, you're recording a I'm podcast. <laughs> yeah, it's look, it's got oh, it's Squawk got... Ident on there. It, uh, I was uh, I like that. Just I use my iPad for the um, the show notes. Yeah. And while you guys went on break, I I was actually looking for my schedule, <laughs> and I and I oh, it's not in in. Uh, it's not you know, CCI, but then I saw, oh, there's a message there. Let's see what it says. Yeah. So anyway, that's how I saw it. And Kyle, what about <laughs> you? What's, what's coming up? Oh, closing a new house next week. Um, closing on our old house in two weeks. Uh, go back on call on Thursday for four days. Um, and just taking care of the family uh, while the wife works. And uh, that's about it. Packing up cool. still. Yeah. Well, so, enjoy your well, packing. Well. It's uh, it's not something I would. Uh, Actually, have a hard move day. <laughs> uh, well, uh, we gave the lease back uh, through August. I think it was eighteenth. Yeah, seventeenth okay. or eighteenth, and then uh, um, we'll be moving in after that. We got a uh, carpet guy coming uh, tomorrow. Uh, we're meeting him at the new house. So nice. Uh, put Get in some. Place. Yeah, put cool. it in, and the house is only. Is it six years old, something like that. But uh, yeah, there's a few little things that uh, we discussed about uh, doing prior to moving in, which would make it easier, and a little bit more uh, cheap, cheaper. So yeah. I think we're gonna do that, and Excellent. that's about it. Cool, well, man. Good. I that's look forward to hearing about that on the next one. I uh, do appreciate you. Welcome to the Squad yeah. Dead End Crew. Love, love I enjoy you. it, yeah, man. Yeah, Roger couldn't Great make addition. it uh, today. Um, but hopefully we can have him on board on one of these future shows and all four of us can continue to wax on poetic about aviation, this career, and everything we love about it. <laughs> I also want to say thank you for taking this journey with us and listening to our podcast as Flight 83 is starting its final descent into the virtual airport. We here at Squawk Ident would like to thank you for coming along board this adventure with us. Please help us out and make sure to subscribe and follow the Squawk Ident podcast. Please spend a moment to write us a review, especially if you're listening on Apple Podcasts. Every review helps us out in the standing tremendously. We do appreciate your support and especially your feedback. You can even send us audio feedback via our website at aviatortony.com. That's Alpha, Victor, the number eight, Romeo, Tango, Oscar, November, Yankee.com. And there you can also find audio archives for past shows, photos from the flight line, our Squawk Ident pilot shop where you can order any kind of goodies from coffee mugs to t-shirts to hats and uh, you name it. Uh, you can also contribute to the show financially right there from the homepage. And if you're on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, you can find us under the Squawk Ident podcast search. A big final thank you to Rob D. and Kyle J. for joining me today. And a big thank you to you for taking the time to listen to these grateful aviators. Keep the dirty side down out there. Be safe and take care of each other. Bye, everyone. We'll see Later. You.